um, good morning, everybody, and and we're really glad to be here, and uh, and and we have a bunch of really exciting things to talk about uh, that are coming up for uh, 2021 uh, that that um, that you guys would I think would be really interested in, and um, and and so so what we want to do well let me first do some introductions. Um, um, there's the two of us presenting. I'm uh, Brad Miller. Uh, oh, and next slide, Austin. On the next slide. Um, uh, I'm Brad Miller, and um, so I've been working on WPI Lib stuff, the you know the software libraries that you guys use to program your FRC robots since uh, 2009, when it actually when it first showed up, when National Instruments first got involved with first, and uh, and 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 we work we do that uh, at WPI, and then we um, um, and 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 now there's a whole bunch of other. It started at just the WPI. And and now it's expanded. And there's volunteers all over all over uh, right now all over the United States that are uh, contributing to the software libraries. Um, uh, I'm the associate director of the Robotics Resource Center at WPI, and what that means is that uh, um, I'm I'm involved in uh, outreach for um, for WPI to programs um, like high school programs like First and other programs like that. Um, and and I've been a mentor on um, FRC Team 190. Uh, we were a, we're a legacy team. We've been around since 1992, and um, uh, and I'm a mentor on that team uh, as well. So that's sort of what I my story is. And I teach robotics at WPI. Throw that in, um, and and that's that's uh, my story. Austin. Yeah, and I'm Austin. Oh, am I muted? Do you hear me, Brad? Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, I'm Austin. I uh, was a WPI student, but I actually just graduated like last week. Um, and I started out doing first all the way back in 2008 when I was playing with uh, the Lego robots. And um, then as I grew older, I started working with FRC and uh, eventually started working on WPI Lib back in 2016. Um, so I guess we'll jump into it. Okay, and Austin's kind of modest. He's actually now a software engineer at SpaceX. So uh, next time you see a launch, you know you can look for him uh, down in the control room when they're when they're launching rockets. Um, so all right, let's get going. Um, the agenda. Let's look at the agenda um, uh, for today. So what we're going to talk about is uh, how to write programs using the WPI Lib suite of tools. So we're going to show a bunch of the tools. There's there's many tools that we're not going to show that that are worth learning about, but in the one hour or the less than an hour that we have to talk about it, we're, we're just going to show the, some of the main stuff. Uh, and, and the first one, the one that's used most is, um, is uh, oh, and the other thing we're going to, sorry, and then the other thing we're going to talk about is a new, a new very inexpensive robot for FRC, so you can learn, use it to learn how to write programs. So, so that's that's pretty exciting. And, uh, and, and we're actually going to write programs, when we write programs today, we're going to write them for this new robot. And then you guys can um, uh, you can actually buy these and play with them uh, yourself and do the same thing that we're doing. Um, the the main tool that we use for writing software for FRC robots is is a tool a tool called Visual Studio Code, which comes from Microsoft, and um, and and VS Code is um, uh, is is this uh, in, this the integrated development environment which combines uh, text editors and compilers and all the tools that you need to be able to uh, write robot programs. Uh, and, and so that's, that's what we use for, for developing this stuff. Um, we're going to write some simple programs, um, simple WPI Lite programs, and uh, we're going to run some programs on the Romy. So we'll show you what that looks like. So we're going to write some programs from scratch, and then we're going to run them on the Romy. OK, you want to keep going? One of the, one of the things that um, we that's really, really important, and, and I'm saying this now at the beginning, and maybe I'll say it again at the end, is that uh, very often, you know, we see teams, uh, you know, building their robot, and then they don't start programming it because they don't have the robot yet. You know, the robot's not done, so they can't program it. And, um, and what we, you know, you really can start early, especially with the tools that exist now. Um, they're kind of designed so you could start programming the robot as soon as you have any idea at all of what the robot's going to look like, um, and and you can get going. And so you don't want to be 
you know, the team that, you know, cause always the hardware always like uh, the schedule for the hardware always like goes past the, the date that you need it, you know, that it's got to get bagged or that you have to bring it to a competition or something. And people are still working on the hardware. So you can't wait till it's done. You really have to start early on the software. And there's a whole bunch of tools these days uh, in WP Live to help you do that and even help you do some testing on the software even before the robot is finished. So that's that's a key message. Start you, in the first or second week, you should be able to start writing programs for your robot um, after the kickoff. All right, so uh, let's see what's next. So the suite of tools that we have, um, there's a bunch of things that are, that are um, uh, that we have one thing is the software libraries that support the robot controllers and those software libraries are um, um, the things the, the, the software that has the the code that operates the motors and the sensors and a bunch of other utility things and stuff like that that let you come you know build your robot program so the idea is that you um, um, you can you, you build your robot program using um, the base libraries and then you write your own code to make it do, make the robot do what you want and um, uh, so that's that's sort of how it works. The next tool that we have here, hit, hit enter over there, is is uh, we can you can write programs in either C and Java. Actually, you can also use uh, Python if you want and LabVIEW. Those are LabVIEW is a, an officially supported language. Python is not. There's a few teams that use it. Um, and I suspect over time more teams may start using Python. Um, but those are the languages that are available. Um, there's there's a plugin for uh, Visual Studio Code. And, and the, what the plugin does is it, is it uh, just installs a bunch of commands and adds stuff to, to VS Code for FRC so that you can build your programs and deploy them to the robot. So you need, so when you install everything, all the stuff will just be on your computer. You don't have to worry about each of these things individually or making sure they're installed. And then there's lots of other tools that we have to uh, help develop robot programs. Um, oh, one other tool that's actually not on here um, that you'll see in a little bit that's really important is that uh, very often you, you uh, want to do like vision stuff with your robot. You want to have a camera and be able to detect vision targets and things like that. And so a good way of doing that is to have a coprocessor, uh, a separate small computer. Uh, and and the, the kind of the, the, the standard one that we uh, support is the Raspberry Pi. And so we have an image for the Raspberry Pi that you can use. And you'll see that we use that for the Romy also, um, this little robot we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, and everything here is open source, community developed. So you can see the source code for all the WPI Live stuff. It's all available. Um, so that's pretty good. So the first thing you have to do when you wanna get going with is getting the development tools and installing them on your computer. And the tools work on um, any major uh, operating system. So you can use Linux and Macs and Windows. Uh, works on all those platforms. Um, uh, you want to get the uh, a Raspberry Pi image, uh, which used to be called FRC Vision, and now it's called WPI Live Pi because now it does more tricks than than just Vision. And and then you need to get the NI tools, which gets you the driver station. So when you're on a field, you can turn the robot on and off. And you need the imaging tools so you can load new images onto your Robo Rio. Uh, for the little robot we're going to talk about in just a minute, you don't need the NI tools. You could start without that if you want to just do C++ and Java development. If you want to do LabVIEW development, then you have to get all the NI stuff. Um, and so the instructions for installing and for everything are uh, at docs.wpilive.org. So if you go there, you'll find documentation for everything. And I think the documentation is right now is showing uh, last year's documentation, but any day now it's gonna, is it switched? Is yeah, it still... so we, we switched it over already. All right, just so it just switched, stop. so now it's 2021 documentation. So if you go there, you'll see all the stuff about how to use the tools that we're talking about today. Um, One thing that's really uh, special, Brad, is there's been a whole group of people that have been working on translating the documentation oh, to yes. Spanish. So if you if you go to the the bottom left corner, you can now choose uh, what language is best for you. And uh, if you want to use Spanish, you can choose Spanish. If you want to pick another language that we offer, you can pick one of those. Yeah, and we and and you know there's it, it, there's some credits in there about who uh, you know and, and and you can look at our you can look at wplive.org, but it kind of says who's who's been doing this. We just, we just want to 
again, just thank those guys for, for all the time that they spent translating the documentation. It's huge. And uh, lots and lots of pages and lots and lots, lots of words. And, uh, and, and so they spent a lot of time and they did an excellent job on that so that you guys can have, uh, you know, translated versions of everything. Um, okay, so today we're using the beta version of WPI Live. Um, that's, that's actually available. And I think if you look in the docs or if you look at um, the, w, the um, uh, WPILive.org webpage, you can see where to get that. Um, but then in a few days, the release will come out, uh, you know, on the 9th. And then, and then, then you can use the, the standard release. Um, okay, so what we're going to talk about today, what we're using today for a computer, this is this is like really exciting. This is one of the this is one of the coolest things um, that I think that we've done this year. Is we added support for a small robot called the Romy, and uh, the way this works is that you can buy one of these um, little robots. And if you look at the documentation, it shows you, you know, shows you where to get it. And there's even a discount code for first team. So you can get it at a discount. It costs about hundred dollars for the Romy kit. And then you have to get a Raspberry Pi for it, which, which adds about another uh, $40 or so. Um, and, but the great thing about this is that you can write WPI live programs, the same programs that using all the same tools and all the same libraries and all, everything is the same as you've been using for um, programming your big robots, but you can program this small robot, which is really, really nice for learning, uh, especially these days when many teams may not be able to meet together uh, or there may not be uh, uh, large competitions. So teams can get these small robots and they can uh, practice programming with them. And, and like I said, the same techniques will just apply to the big robots. Um, and, and so the way this actually works is that when you write the program, the WPI Lite program, it runs on your desktop and then communicates over Wi-Fi from your desktop or your laptop computer to the Romy. And so the running program on your laptop tells the Romy what to do. So it tells the motors how fast to spin and which way it should drive. And it, and the, and it gets sensor data back from the Romy um, that you can uh, use in your program. And there's a bunch of sensors on the Romy and, and actually there's four ports where you can add more sensors and more servos and stuff so you can make it more interesting. So that's the robot we're gonna be using today. And the challenge we're gonna do, I think Austin modified this a little bit, but it's basically like this, where we're gonna have the robot in this, in this particular example, you know, we had the robot starting at position one and then it drove to position two without crossing any black lines. And, uh, and I think he didn't have a field that was as big as the one that, that, uh, that I used for this. So it's, he'll do something a little bit different, but you'll get the idea. And, um, and so we're gonna show you how to write a program real easily that lets the program do this navigation, which is a similar kind of problem to what you might do in an autonomous mode uh, during the autonomous period for your FRC robot. So we're gonna show you how to do that. We're just gonna write the program uh, you know, right here. So the method that we use for writing programs. And what we found the easiest way to get people going and to be able to write fairly complex robot programs um, without all the, all the complexity and without having code that's hard to understand and hard to extend and hard to test um, is using um, something called command-based programming. And really I shouldn't have been, I should say it the other way, that this, this really, like on the next slide, it kind of describes some of the features it, it's, um, um, it's, a, it's a way of writing programs for first robots that, um, that make them easy to write. Um, and Austin, go to the next slide. Easy to write, easy to extend. Um, okay, they're really easy to write these programs. They're really easy to extend the programs and make them more, you know, keep making them more and more complex and adding more features to them. Um, easy to debug. Um, and, and, and really easy to test them. And it's really easy to get good reuse of the code. So if you write some code that does something like gets the robot to be able to drive for some distance, you can just use that over and over again in your program real easily, both for the teleop and the autonomous parts of your uh, robot program. So that's what we're gonna use this, this thing called command-based programming. And that's what you're gonna see today. Um, so let's look at the next thing, like how, what a robot program looks like. So, um, if you, 
if you um, create, and, and this is what Austin will show you this, but when you create a sample or when you create a template, uh, you, you create your robot project, you start from a template that's built into uh, VS Code and you get a bunch of files. And some of the files you get are this thing called main, you get this main.java file, which is the main program. You don't have to touch that. You get another program called robot.java and you basically don't have to do much to that either. That's the one that kind of controls the flow of the program through autonomous and teleop and test modes and enabled and disabled and all that stuff. You'll see that in robot Java. There's um, uh, another file called robot container Java that uh, is where you can create all of your subsystems and commands and set up bindings to joysticks and buttons and things like that. And you'll see that. And there's another file where you can put constants if you, if you have constants that are used globally throughout the program. Um, and then from there, you just add other files uh, for what, what are called your subsystems and your commands. And we'll, we'll talk about that right now. So a fundamental concept in doing this, this is like really important, is that you want to look at your robot and kind of divide it up into subsystems, you know, kind of logically what all the pieces of your robot do. So here's a little robot that we sometimes use for uh, workshops and stuff. It's got a Robo Rio on it and it runs, you know, you can drive it on, a, on the desktop or on the floor in a room. And, but it's got a drive subsystem, which is the, uh, all the drive components. So it's got you know, all the stuff that's on the chassis. So it's got the, the drive motors and uh, maybe it's got the encoders for the drive motors, the wheel encoders. And it's got, um, uh, maybe it's got the, the, the IMU or the gyro. All those parts that are part of the chassis are in this drive subsystem. And then, and then this particular robot has an arm on it. So we made another subsystem and we called it arm because, well, it's controlling an arm. And this robot's got another thing on it, which is a gripper, which is, which is hard to see. It's behind where it says gripper. And, and uh, so that's the third subsystem that this robot has. So, so fundamentally, you can divide the robot program up into these subsystems and each subsystem takes care of controlling the sensors and motors for that subsystem. Um, so go to, go to the next slide and we can talk about this a little bit. Um, so subsystem is a class, okay? It's a Java or a C++ class. And it's really what we call an encapsulation or it's all of the stuff that operates a particular robot subsystem. So, so like arms, drivetrains, elevators, grippers, intakes, for balls or something and shooters, those are all subsystems. And, and the code that you put in, and each subsystem is a Java or C++ class. And the code you put inside the class is everything you need to operate those subsystems. And, and this is, this is um, implementing something that we call the single responsibility principle. That means that each subsystem is only responsible for doing one thing. So the arm system only operates the arm and the drivetrain subsystem only operates the drivetrain and the elevator subsystem only operates the elevator and so on. And this, this principle is key to making sure that your program is easy to extend, it's easy to understand and, um, and it's easy to debug. So this is, a, this is very, very important. And, and so, so you know, when you go to college and you learn about computer programming, they'll tell you about the single responsibility principle. But the point is by built, breaking your program up into subsystems, you're basically implementing that. And, um, uh, and, and so let's go on to the next slide. Uh, we'll talk about the next thing. So what we're gonna do right now is we're actually gonna just start writing a program. And, uh, and Austin's gonna create a chassis subsystem for our little Romy robot, the blue Romy robot you saw in the picture. So Austin, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, so let's just jump right into it. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and launch the Visual Studio Code development tool um, that we've been using. And I'm going to create a new window just so we don't get confused. Um, and the first thing to do is to create a new robot project. So we're going to do that by clicking the WPI lib logo at the top and searching for create a new project. And because we're using the Romy robot today, what we can do is we can actually pick the Romy template, which will have all of the 
things necessary to launch the program on the Romy instead of on the RoboRio. I'm just going to save this into my desktop folder and I'll give it a project name of warm up. I'll enter my team number and we'll create generate. We'll click generate project. So once that finishes, we can take a look and see all the files that Brad was talking about before. We have the constants file, the main file, the robot file, and the robot container file. But also because we're using the Romy, the Romy drivetrain subsystem already gets generated for us with some interesting con with uh, the hardware and constants we need in order to operate the robot. Um, we do need to make some changes to this file and we'll do those kind of as we go along. Uh, but just getting started at the top here, uh, we have some constants that we're going to use when writing our robot program. So we have the number of counts per revolution. And what that is, is a relationship between the encoder and how far the wheel moves. So every time the wheel gives us one revolution or one spin, how many encoder counts should we expect? Um, I'm going to change this to be negative um, because we're running the beta version today. Um, the other thing that we need to know is we need to be able to convert revolutions to the number of inches the robot is going to actually travel. And to do that, we need the wheel diameter. So here's the wheel diameter in inches and in millimeters. I'm going to make this a little bigger so it's easier to see. We, of course, need our motor controllers. These are what actually power the wheels on the robot. So we have our spark motor controllers. Um, now on the Romy, we're not actually using sparks, but the spark is a representative controller. So we can use it here. We need our encoders. And what an encoder does, allows us to do is it'll tell us how far we've gone and how fast we're moving. So we have encoders, one for each side of the drivetrain. And then WPI lib comes with all these helper classes. So uh, it comes with this differential drive helper class, which is like a tank drive or differential drive, which has two independently controlled sides of a robot. And we're going to use that to help us. We do some configuration and it comes with a uh, method to drive the robot, to reset the encoders, to get the left distance we've traveled, the right distance we've traveled. Um, so yeah, and what we can do right off the bat is with writing no code, except I fixed the, the negative sign, is we can actually run this robot program and test it using test mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and turn on my robot over here. And we'll wait for that to connect. While it's waiting, I'll just point out that so so the the Raspberry Pi that's on the Romy has um, Wi-Fi on it, and so when it starts up, it starts up with its own Wi-Fi network that you connect to. That says Rome, you know, that says um, uh, that that. Uh, well, you'll see it in a second. It's got it, it, it's the uh, it's got a number on it that's unique to the particular Romy that you're using, um, and it and it takes it about uh, half a minute to uh, boot up and get the Wi-Fi network going. But that's how you talk to it. There it is. So yeah, so they all start with WPLI Pi, then this unique number. So now that we're connected to the wireless network, we can go ahead and start our robot program. And to do that, it's kind of funny, but we're going to say simulate robot code on desktop. So we're going to launch the robot program on our desktop, but it's going to communicate with the Romy over there. Uh, 
Okay, and we can see that we're successfully connected to the Romy. And we'll just make this view a little bit bigger for us. How's that look, Brad? Looks good. Okay, so what we can do is if we go to our network tables view and we open up our differential drive and we go to test mode without actually writing any code, we can now act, move the robot around. So if I make the left motor spin forward, you can see in the video that the robot spins forward. And if we make it spin backwards, the robot spins backwards. Um, and we can do the same with the right-hand side. So this is a really, unless we drive off the table, um, this is a really powerful tool to show, uh, to validate that the robot electrical system is working. And you can use this tool on your real FRC robots too. Um, okay, so now that our um, Romy subsystem is complete, I'm going to pass it back off to Brad to talk about how we can use this subsystem to uh, write an autonomous program. So take it away, Brad. Okay, so so the thing that's um, uh, so the, so the the subsystems let you actually control the subsystem itself, and so you saw that there were some. Um, uh, methods or functions inside of the inside of that uh, chassis subsystem or inside the whatever it was called the Romy uh, chassis subsystem that, um, that that lets you drive the motors and and lets you see the encoder counts and things like that. But but um, if you want to do something more complicated like a, like a real autonomous program, then you got to do more than that. I mean, you got to be able to string together a bunch of uh, operations. You have to be able to get the robot to drive for some distances, and you know that sort of stuff. And so the way we do that is we write also we write classes to do that. And each of those classes that lets the robot uh, move for some distance, or or operate some mechanism, or do some particular task is called a command. And so each of these robot actions or these behaviors. Um, are commands and they use the all the methods that are in the subsystem so the subsystem can just turn the motors on and off and return sensor values the commands use that data to actually make the robot do interesting things and if you if you um if you know about state machines if you've heard of state machines before then the commands are essentially each command represents a state in a state machine but it's a much uh fancier uh kind of more modern way of doing it and, and so the way commands work is that each command that you write, okay, which, which would do something, um, it starts out being idle, and then it initializes uh, when you start it up. And when the command starts, it calls a method inside of it that you can write called initialize. And that just sets it up. So it may turn on some motors or it may initialize some sensors or it may do you know, something else. Um, so it does that. And then the next thing that happens is now that now this command is executing and it calls your execute method and it calls another method is finished repeatedly. So the execute method is where you make the command do its stuff like drive the motors or shoot balls or something, you know, like whatever the command should do. Um, the is finished method returns false until the command is finished, then it returns true. And then that tells the system the command is finished running. And then the commands end method gets called. And in the end method, that's the place where you put some code to um, stop the motors. So if you say you wanted to do something like write a command where the robot's going to drive forward for a foot, then you might initialize it by um, uh, starting up the motors. And you may, ex in the execute method, you may not, you may not have to do anything because the motors are now started and the robot is driving. But in the uh, is finished method, you test to see if you've gone a foot yet. And if you have, you return true. If you haven't, you return false. And so it keeps executing over and over again um, until you've gone a foot. And then it calls the end method and the end method would stop the motor. So the robot would stop after driving one foot. So, so that's fundamentally how commands work. And um, so here, go to the next slide. What commands can start there's a bunch of ways of getting commands to start. One way is at the start of the autonomous period. So you can pick a command 
And you can say, I want this command to run um, when autonomous starts. And what you'd put there is your command that actually does the whole autonomous part of your program. So you just say, run this command during autonomous and the robot just goes and does it all. Um, you can manually start commands um, by putting in some code into your program and causing a command to start. Um, you can also have commands that are tied to subsystems that run when no other commands are running that use that subsystem. That's called the default command. So you may have a command, for instance, that um, reads the joysticks and writes to the motors when nothing else is using the chassis. And that way your robot can drive around using the joysticks. Um, and you may trigger commands off of different things. So you can tie a command to a button on a joystick. So when you press the button, then the command runs and the robot does stuff. So it's a really good way of um, adding these uh, capabilities um, to your robot. Like say one of them is shoot some balls. Um, so you could you can make a command that shoots balls. You can tie it to a particular button on your joystick or on your gamepad. And when you press the button, the robot shoots balls. Um, so that's kind of nice. And, and so you can make a whole bunch of commands and you can just tie them to buttons. And then the last thing you can do for testing is every time you create a command, you can make a dashboard button for it. So Austin was showing you on the dashboard before how he was able to drive the robot around even before we wrote any code. Um, well, you can get buttons for each command. And so when you press the button, it runs the command. And uh, so that's pretty nice. Um, so this is how you start commands. And then commands stop when that finish condition is met. So when the is finished method returns true, the command stops. Or another way that a command can stop is if it's interrupted. So say you told the robot to drive forward for like 10 feet and the robot starts driving. And then you say, no, no, I really meant I wanted it to turn right. So you press the turn right command. And what happens is that both commands, the drive forward command and the uh, turn right command are both trying to use the chassis subsystem. And so um, the commands know which subsystems they're using. And so if you, if you uh, try to use the chassis subsystem while another command is using it, the first command gets interrupted and then the second command runs and, and then um, the command ends. And, and then the second command starts running. So you can change your mind and have something else start running uh, instead of what was running before. And that's, that's called interrupting a command. Okay, um, so what we'll do now is add some commands to this project. And you'll see how easy it is to do this and make the robot do a bunch of, a bunch of stuff. So Austin, go for it. Oops. Um, yeah, thanks, Brad. So um, let's jump right into it. If we open up our uh, commands directory, what we can do to get started is we can right click and create, click create a new class slash command. And what we'll do is we'll create a new command. And we'll give it a name. So I'm going to name mine forward because this one that we're going to work on, uh, its goal will be to move the robot forward. And what we get is we get a um, a template that we need to fill out to use the command. So just to get started, we know that our forward command is going to need to use the Romy drivetrain. So what we're going to need to, and what that allows is it does the interruption thing that Brad was just talking about, where if we start two commands at once, the old one will get interrupted. So what we'll do is we're going to make a call to a method called add requirements. And what this does is it tells the command what uh, subsystems it's going to use. Um, we do need to also make one more change to the robot container, which is adding the word static here. Um, what that does is it will let us access the um, access the drivetrain directly instead of needing to pass it around. You can use either method uh, for programming your robot. So now that we've done that, we'll, we can now access that variable by calling robot container. 
dot the drive train. And now we've started our command off. The next thing that we want to think about is what we want to happen when the command first starts running, when the command is executing, when the command should finish, and what should happen when the command is finished. So when the command first starts running, we're going to use the, the encoders for this command to drive a, a certain number of inches. We want to make sure that the current number of inches is equal to zero. Because if you had been driving your robot around uh, using the joystick, maybe the left wheel uh, has now driven 10 inches and the right wheel has driven 15 inches, we want to make sure that both of those are zero when we start the command so we can keep track of how far we've traveled. Um, if you remember from last time we wrote or it came pre-built, we have a function called reset encoders that we can call. And this will reset the encoders back to zero. So let's go ahead and call that right now. We'll say robot container dot drive train dot reset encoders. Awesome. I think that's all we need for initialize. So let's continue on to what happens when the command is actually running. So when the command's actually running, we want the robot to, as the command says, drive forward. Um, and we can also do that by using one of the functions we already wrote in the drivetrain class. So once again, we'll go and access the drivetrain class. And then what we'll say is we have an arcade drive uh, method and it requires two parameters. One of the parameters is how fast we're going to travel in the X axis, which is how fast forward. And the other parameter is how much we want to rotate or turn by. So uh, in this case, I think a good number to use is 15%. So this is a number between negative one and one. So we're going to say 0.15 for the forward direction. And in the turning direction, we don't want to turn with this command. So we'll say zero. Okay. Two down, two to go. So I like doing the is finished um, function next. What we're going to do here is we're going to write code that determines when the command should end. So we're driving forward. When do we know we should stop? And I think the, the best thing to do is we can use the encoders on the robot to figure out when we should stop. Um, now, just like before in all of our other functions, we had a way of determining how far along we were in the drivetrain class. So let's go and call that function. Just for today, to make it easy, we're only going to look at the left-hand side. Um, we can look at both sides and do some averaging there or something else. Today, just the left-hand side. And what we want to do is we want to we're, we're done with the command when we've traveled more than or equal to the number of inches we want to travel. Um, so we could put a number in here like six, and this would work fine. Um, but maybe it's better if we have this be configurable so we can drive forward any number of inches. So to do that, what we can do is we can, at the very top of our class, create a variable to remember the number of inches that we want to travel. So we'll create a variable to do that by typing private double distance. And then when we create this command, we will set that distance to be uh, what, what we want to provide. So we'll provide a number here, we can say, distance equals inches. So this piece of code will get called when we first create the command and it'll remember how far we want to travel. And then down here, we will do the comparison. So has the distance we've traveled, is the distance we've traveled greater than or equal to the distance that we set when we first uh, created the command. Now, now we can use this um, 
Oh, now we have to write the, um, the end command. So the end command, well, what do we want to happen when the command is finished is we're just going to stop the robot from moving. So we can say, again, the drivetrain. And here we'll just say zero speed forward and zero speed turning. Let's use this uh, command on our robot just to prove that it's working. So I'm going to turn the robot on. And we'll wait for it to go. Just because we're running a little short on time today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I have a turn command pre-prepared that I'm going to copy into our robot project. And this turn command is really similar to the forward commands that we just wrote. Except I'm missing some things. Um, right, we, we take in the angle that we want to turn. We do some math to figure out um, how far we need to turn. In initialize, we reset the encoders. In execute, we're going to, instead of driving forward, we're going to drive with a turning speed. When we end the command, we're going to stop all movement. And to calculate if we're finished, we're going to check to see if the distance we've traveled is more than or equal to the number of inches. Okay, so just like before, we'll connect to the row the Romy Wi-Fi network. There it is. And we'll start simulating the robot code on the desktop. And actually, I think we only have a few more minutes. Um, yeah, so I, the plan is we're going to, to demo these, and then we'll, we'll take questions from the, the chat, if that works for you, Brad. Yep. So what, what we can do is if we go into teleoperated mode and open up our a different tool, which is the dashboard, um, you can also use shuffleboard, or you can create the buttons inside of the hardware UI, the robot simulation UI itself, we can now actually run the robot. So if I click the forward button, and I have a bug. Did you, uh, did you write the command to the dashboard? I did not, thank you. So one last thing we need to do is we need to add the commands to the dashboard. Those commands were old, thank you, Brad. Um, and to do that, what we can do is in our robot container, which is kind of like the home base for everything, we can add the commands by calling smart dashboard dot put data. And put data is a catch all. You can put almost anything in put data. And we'll put our command. So we'll say forward. And we'll type in our command and how far we want to travel. So when we push the button on the dashboard, we'll drive forward six inches. And we'll do two more. We'll say turn 90. And we're going to use the turn commands that we wrote for turning 90 degrees. And just for completeness, we'll say turn negative 90. Maybe we can, um, well, let's see. Yeah, if you guys, if anybody has questions, um, be sure to put them into the uh, Q&A um, so we can we can answer them. Yeah, uh, we're open for questions, we're just waiting for them. And as soon as we get them, we're gonna tell them to you. Okay, sounds good.
I'm, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, hang on. We'll go this to the, the problem program. with doing live demos. Is... We'll go to the go to the finished program. Oh, here, let's try this one. So if we enable teleoperated mode, go to the dashboard, we can see there the robot can drive forward. And if we wanted to do our little challenge, we can turn left, go forward again, turn left again, go forward again. Don't fall off the table. We fell off the table. Um, so we're running a little short on time, but um, what we can do is you can use these commands and the buttons on the dashboard to test each piece of each command. And then if we had another 15 minutes or so, we could chain the commands together into one complete labyrinth command. And I can actually demo demonstrate that right now. So I have the labyrinth command already written, which I can show, but this will run all the commands in sequence that we wrote and complete the challenge. So pretty nifty. Okay, estamos recibiendo ya las primeras preguntas de los asistentes. Cuando ustedes estén listos, se las puedo empezar a, a leer. So there's a question, uh, there's a question in here about um, which is better for FRC robots. Uh, I'm not sure which, when you say which is better, I'm not sure which things you're comparing, but um, we recommend using the command-based framework for sure to get started um, uh, for almost all FRC robot programs, if that's what you're asking. And the command-based uh, framework really is, oh, you never want to use time-based programming. Um, well, okay, so it's a little bit complicated, a little confusing. Um, you never want to make the robot drive based on time. In other words, you never want to say to the robot, oh, just drive for like 10 seconds because I know in 10 seconds I'll go some distance. Because as the batteries die or the surface it's traveling on is different or other things, the weight of the robot changes and all that stuff, then the time that it drives in 10 seconds will change or the distance it drives in 10 seconds will keep changing. So you never want to do that. The reason it's a little bit confusing is that this template that all this stuff is based on is called the timed robot template, but it's that's that's a little bit more complicated. That just is how often it's 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 cycling through running all these commands, and and there's a and that's a fixed time, and that's why it's called time. Uh, uh, you know, it's called a um, uh, this time-based template. Okay, what other questions? How can a team program together in this pandemic working from home? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the problem is the problem is access to the robot. And, and unfortunately, FRC robots are, are pretty big and heavy and go really fast. And so you really can't have one of those inside of your home because it will, I don't know, run over pets and small children. And, and that's always bad. So um, that's why we have the Romy. So the idea is that teams can, um, can have uh, one or more Romy's and those you can use at home. So you can use those on a tabletop and, and just program and drive it. That's what Austin was doing. It doesn't go very fast. It doesn't hurt if it runs into you. And, um, and that was kind of the idea. Um, but when you're working as a team, you're trying to figure out how multiple people can cooperate working on a program. The idea is that different team members can work on different subsystems and different team members can work on different commands. And then you can test those using the dashboard all separately. So when you're back together, it's really easy to use the subsystems and commands as command based programming for all the members of the team to get involved uh, working separately. And then you can put the commands together to make more complicated commands like Austin showed with the labyrinth. Um, uh, or you can use Romy's uh, until you can get together and, and then and different team members can have a Romy. Okay. So just yep. to add to that, Brad, there there is a if you if you have two people that want to work together, there are tools that uh, exist to do that, and you can learn more about them in our documentation. Okay, tenemos una siguiente pregunta. ¿Cuál consideran que es el mejor programa para programar? <laughs> Uh, 
So I, I think the, the, the question's asking for like which, um, like command-based or time-based or, um, Maybe eh, me, me parece que, que sí es bastante ambigua. Entonces, en, en ese caso, eh, le recomendamos a la persona que la hizo que por favor la reformule y la envíe de nuevo. La siguiente pregunta es, ¿existen ventajas de utilizar C++ a comparación de Java en FRC? Sí, yeah, so what, what we recommend is that teams use the programming language that they're able to get the most support for. So if you have mentors on your team that know Java, um, you should totally go with Java. If you have uh, mentors or teams around you that know C++, you should go with C++. And same thing for, for LabVIEW. Um, we, we really try hard to make sure that all of the features, or almost all the features, can go into every language. Um, of course, there's small differences because in C++ you have different features than what you have in Java, but we really do try that um, almost all the features are in both, uh, in all three or both languages. Okay. So use, use the one that you can get the most help with. Okay, well, so for a better flow of conversation, I'll be switching to English. <laughs> uh, I mean, as for the, for the interpreter to, to get my, what I'm saying. So, well, we get, we're running out of time, but we got a bunch of other questions. So I'm gonna select a few. So there's an anonymous question. Except, does it exist any plugin to work at the same time in the same code? Yeah, so as I was mentioning before, there's, there's lots of tools to do that. There's um, two options that I've used is one's called Git, which uh, lets, it's not working at the same exact time, but it allows multiple people to collaborate. Another one is in Visual Studio Code, there's a plugin called the Live Share plugin. And what that does is it's like Google Docs, where if one person is typing in a particular file, everyone else can see that file and type in it at the same time. Okay, awesome. Well, the next question is, why are you using another processor good? Is there any other processor good for using a camera or a similar sensor? Yeah, we, we, um, we, so we recommend the Raspberry Pi uh, for, an, for an FRC robot. And that's actually what's also running on the Romy because the Raspberry Pi um, can do all the vision processing on the little coprocessor and it takes, it takes the load of doing that compute intensive vision processing off of the Robo Rio. So the robot can run more smoothly and the vision system can operate more quickly. And so, so that's why we use a co why we recommend using a coprocessor for vision. Other teams use more expensive coprocessors, but um, for the most part, we found that the Raspberry Pi is probably good enough for doing 99% of the things that you want to do with it. Um, and you can also use the Raspberry Pi that's on the Romy to practice writing vision programs the same way you would for your FRC robots. Okay. Well, thank you very much. There are another. But there are some other questions, but unfortunately we're out of time. It's been an amazing, almost 50 minutes with you guys. So just uh, a quick reminder, from this year on, uh, WPI Live is now releasing the documentation in several languages, thanks to the efforts of much of the teams that have been working translating them. So you can get them in their site. And well, it's been an honor to have you here with us, Brad. Austin, I don't know if you get any other final remark or, or any other tip for rookie teams or all the teams that are watching you today. Um, I, I guess the, the one thing that I'll add is if anyone uh, is watching this and has questions um, or you find something that doesn't seem quite right, come come visit us on our on our GitHub page, um, WPI Lib Suite. And, um, We'd be happy to answer more questions there anytime. Uh, and thank you so much to, to everyone uh, yeah. for, for having us and helping with the, the translation effort. Yep, I, yep. I echo, I'd echo the same remarks. And, and be sure, if you see things that you think are wrong or you don't understand or don't seem to be working right, be sure to let us know. Because we, you know, I mean, this is a community project. Lots and lots of volunteers are working on it. 
And, and, and we really like to have contributions from teams that where they find something wrong or they, they want to add some code or something. So, so keep in touch with us. Awesome. The job, what you're doing, it's just amazing. And it's a pleasure for us to have you here with us. And of course, uh, anyone who is willing to get more information or got any other questions, feel free to reach out for Austin or Brad and all the other people working for WPI Live. And uh, well, thank you very much, guys. And it, it's been a pleasure again. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Have a good day. You too.